On tonight's Top Gear, Jeremy considers the new Cadillac. I meet the ambulance chasers, and Tiff and Tony go all misty-eyed about old rally cars. Cadillacs. Oh, well, my mom and papa told me, son, you gotta make some money. Nice to use on your wedding day, but about as practical for everyday use as a wedding dress. They're big. They're brash. They're the ultimate goal in the American dream. And for the first time in 94 years, they're now being made with right-hand drive, which means they're going to be exported over here. It's never going to work, is it? This is the car in question. The Cadillac Seville STS. There are no fins. There's no chrome. There's no obesity. But then there's no real style either. It happens once every series. We get a truly awful car to test, one that I can really get my teeth into. <laughs> this car is a constant source of surprises. I was, for instance, surprised to find that when the dash wakes up, the resultant laser show can detach both your retinas. This hurts. Now, last year, I drove one of these cars in America and was surprised to find they'd filled the suspension units with porridge. And now I'm surprised all over again because the oats have been replaced with iron filings. It has a firm ride and E-man steering. It almost feels like a sports saloon. But it isn't one. Not by a long way. And the chief culprit is the automatic gearbox. They've taken a lever, I think, from an Abrams tank, and then underneath there's a rubber band, two marrows, and a sort of lemon souffle. So, I put my foot down hard, and we wait, and we wait, and come on, there's the kick down. It's very smooth, but it came exactly 90 seconds after the overtaking opportunity passed me by. There are other reasons why this isn't a sports saloon. It has horrid brakes, it is very tiring to drive, and all the power is fed to the front wheels. The wrong wheels. So how does it stack up then as an executive car? Well, I was expecting to find it finished largely in purple tinfoil with a glitter ball. And here, in the middle of the steering wheel, the Cadillac motif to be picked out in real fake backlit gold. But it's all quite tasteful, really. We've got wood, we've got leather, and though these instruments are a bit sudden, you can turn them off. I guess, really, it's a cross between a Mercedes and a Lexus and a torture chamber. This seat features something called automatic lumbar control. You set the padding just so, and then as you move, it moves with you. Trouble is, it's, it's like having a large jacket potato down the back of your shirt. It's terrible. Not doing very well, is it? It's too front-wheel drive to be much of a rival for BMW and too potatoey to match Jaguar for comfort. And it almost certainly won't be as reliable as a Lexus or a Mercedes. But all is not yet lost because the Cadillac has one outstanding feature. It's 4.6 litre, 300 horsepower V8 engine is an absolute gem. 
Despite the best efforts of the gearbox to ruin everything, the Seville goes from 0 to 60 in 6.8 seconds. It'll hit 150 miles an hour. And then there's the noise. Oh, if Alfa Romeo, Honda, and the London Symphony Orchestra all teamed up, they wouldn't be able to match a sound like that. This engine doesn't need fuel injection. It needs a conductor. And that's just the start. This is unbelievable. But it'll run without oil or water, even if it's the middle of summer and you're in the middle of the Sahara Desert. What it does is use two cylinders. And when they overheat, it shuts them down and selects two cooler ones. Performance isn't brilliant, but at least it'll get you home. And there's another thing. That engine needs servicing only once every 100,000 miles. That's amazing. That's phenomenal. I so desperately wanted to savage this car, but the engine is too good. And so sadly is the price. It costs less than 40,000 pounds. Every conceivable extra, everything you've ever thought of, with the possible exception of a sunroof and satellite navigation, is fitted as standard. Last night I was driving home, and as it got dark, a little sign came on the dashboard. Headlight suggested. So polite. So American. And therein lies my opportunity to go for the kill. Forget the gearbox, forget the silly seat. If you buy this car, you'll have to tell people you have a Cadillac. And here's what they'll think of you. They're in the yellow pages, they're on local radio, they're even plastered on the back of buses. Solicitors soliciting for accident victims. Because injured motorists mean compensation, and 25% of that compensation can go to the solicitor. Which is why some have even set up shop in hospitals. Now, I have to ask this. Isn't this all a bit sort of tasteless, a bit American, having an officer in a hospital? No, we're definitely not. Um, we're reacting to the needs of the people coming to the hospital. Uh, we provide a service not only for the patients here, but also to visitors, the large numbers of members of staff. The service we provide isn't just in relation to accident claims, it's a complete legal service. That is offered on the basis that people can walk through our door at any time. We don't go to them, they can come to us at times which suit them. I'm a heavy goods vehicle driver. I had an accident, a large goods vehicle hit me up the rear. There was no problem with the claim, I paid out as regards that. But the legal people sent me to an orthopaedic surgeon for an examination and x-rays. And there was a problem, but they, they said it was not too bad, but they would get me some compensation for it, which they did. They did very well. It didn't take too long, I got my compensation, 2,500 pounds. Quite happy with it. But there are ambulance chasers and there are ambulance chasers. Some are brilliant, some are opportunists, and some are downright bent. We've heard of all sorts of stories of dodgy operators trousering hundreds of thousands in victims' compensation. Every city, every town in the UK, every day, has got solicitors, accident management companies, and dodgy car hire companies which are making overtly fraudulent claims. They take the person's name and address and they use them to make a whole series of claims, which will include personal injury, it'll include um, something called credit hire, where a person is provided with a hire car and they're told the vehicle is free of charge until your car's repaired. We've seen um, gynaecologists giving expert evidence on, on people with quite serious whiplash injuries. That's commonplace. This fraud has mushroomed over, over the last three to five years. It's getting out of all proportion. There are many solicitors who are very legitimate. There are many, many solicitors who are totally corrupt. And they ought to hang their heads in shame because they know how they are praying 
on innocent victims of road traffic accidents. New car! But whose new car? Is it an Audi? Hardly. I know. It's an Alpha. Never. It's got to be a Nissan. Nope. BMW? Boulder Dash. Can you tell what it is yet? No? Well, then let me give you a really big clue. It's been designed by a team including Italians and Brits for a German-owned company, and it's built in Belgium. It is, of course, that unmistakably Spanish saloon, the new Seat Toledo. Obviously. And because you probably have no recollection of what the old one looked like, and more particularly, because they asked us not to show it you, here's one they made earlier. The old hunchback hatch was a smash hit as a minicab, but the new Toledo is a slinky saloon and aimed firmly at the fiercely competitive fleet market. There may be just the one body style, but there are plenty of engine options from 1.6 to 2.3. This one is the 1.9 turbo diesel with the optional sport handling package. Just as well. You know, I've always thought of turbo diesels as being rather like small dogs, and that they both generate a huge amount of annoying racket without ever really having much in the way of bite. But having said that, this Seat turbo diesel is a bit of a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. You see, from just 1.9 litres, it extracts a whole 110 horsepower. And if that doesn't get you panting like a pointer, then consider this. The dozing Spaniel that is the Mondeo turbo diesel is 20 horsepower down on that, while the yapping Shih Tzu, which is undoubtedly the Vectra turbo diesel, is 30 horsepower down. And it's not just the grin-inducing drive that comes as a pleasant surprise. It really is a rather handsome car. Oh, go the etch-a-sketch lines of old, and in come muscular curves, inspired by Michelangelo. Um, yes. Anyhow, such frivolities won't woo fleet managers, but they should be more impressed by the three-year warranty and competitive pricing. Endearingly eager oil burners are say at stock in trade, but there is a new Toledo, which would seem to indicate they're rather keen to do a spot of social climbing. The 2.3-litre V5 is the most expensive Seat ever, at just under 18 grand. And after many years in the cut-price shallows, the clear blue waters of the business sector must seem wonderfully inviting. But of course, that is the territory of sleek sharks, like the Alpha 156. When a manufacturer moves up market, as Seat have done with this car, they often do so in the belief that you have to adorn the interior with a few acres of dead daisy and a small coppice of wood veneer that ends up looking as plastic as Action Man's parents. Thankfully, that's exactly what Seat haven't done with this car. And for all the claims that this car is the product of a Mediterranean sensibility, its solid substance and classy restraints are almost entirely Teutonic in character. <laughs> Ford is borrowed from the Audi A3. The steering and suspension moonlighting from their day job in the Golf GTI. And of course, there's far more than a family resemblance to the Skoda Octavia. But despite its dubious pedigree, the new Toledo feels distinctively different. And one of its most impressive assets is a package of safety features that includes electronic ABS, traction and stability controls right across the range. Say I want to sell the Toledo on its Spanishness. I think they'd do better to tell people it's a good car. Which caught me by surprise, because I didn't go to Catalonia to pay homage. In fact, I was prepared to expose the Seat as nothing better than an expensive Skoda. But you know what? It looks, feels and drives way too good for that. The new Seat Toledo isn't an expensive Skoda. It's a cheap Audi.
What do you do when business gets quiet? When the only thing that moves is tumbleweed in the showrooms like the Mary Celeste. Think special edition. All you need is a handy kit of meaningless tat to guarantee that stick-on specialness. For years, car makers have been trying to fool us with exclusive sounding models to enrich our lives and make us believe we're kings of the cul-de-sac. Like the last Ford Escort, it racked up 33 special editions. The Citroen AX had 28 nom de plume. Its cousin, the Peugeot 205, had 23. And even Aston Martin came up with an Alfred Dunhill DB7, complete with your very own cigar cutter. Manufacturer special edition is announced or you are able to see it on a manufacturer's price list and would generally be nationally advertised, whereas a dealer special edition is usually very regional, if not to that particular dealer. The better one to have in every case is the manufacturer's special edition because it's recognized nationally. The things that are not worth bothering with special editions as far as the retail customer is concerned are things that can be easily removed from the vehicle wheel trims, body stripes, parcel shelves, different seat covers, incidentals like that. They actually add no value at all to the value of the vehicle. So our advice is don't get off on special editions. Like the man said, silly stripes and names and pop-up sunroofs aren't worth a light. They only confuse buyers when you come to sell. Keep it simple and remember only a few twiddly bits are worth any money second hand. Leather trims worth 500. Alloys and metallic paint, another century. Air conditioning's 500 and ABS around 250. Automatics are good on small cars, bad on medium, but essential on big ones. So get yourself a copy of the manufacturer's price list. Find out what extras your special edition has and how much they'd really cost. That way, it's unlikely that there'll be a lifting of the leg. The RAC Rally has got a noble history. In 1932, it was won by Colonel Loughborough driving a Lanchester, no less. In the 50s, the Jaguar XK120 was winning. But with the 60s came the arrival of the current special stage format, and the car that leapt to prominence was the sensational Saab. Until 1960, the RAC Rally had been a navigational tour of Britain with a few manoeuvrability tests thrown in. But when special stages were introduced, the Saab of Eric Carlson left everyone standing and won three years on the trot. There was perhaps an ever more unlikely rally car with its tiny three-cylinder 850cc two-stroke engine producing only about 70 horsepower. But its jelly mold shape hid great big wheel arches that gave the wheels a lot of travel, helping it to go over rough ground, and it proved incredibly effective. The Saab in the hands of Eric Carlson was an awesome sight. Carlson was an advertising man's dream. Sweden's former soldier of the year was the biggest driver in the smallest car on the rally and won. Carlson, of course, had learned to drive in his native Scandinavia with the snow and it's all about hardly slowing the down. This Saab doesn't go very fast, but change down a gear, it coasts to pick up the throttle and it takes it with you. The secret to driving fast in this little Saab Wolf. That was nearly a dead sheet. Was momentum. Carry the speed through the corner and then pick it up on the way out. Olsen's driving style was quite unique. He would frequently roll the car but would still win. His party trick was single-handedly pushing the car onto its roof and back onto its wheels. So, the 60s belonged to Saab and saw the rise of the Scandinavian drivers. But the 70s meant only one thing, the amazing Ford Escort. The Escort first won the RAC in 1972, and then went on to achieve an incredible eight successive victories on the event which was then much longer and rougher than it is today. The Mark II body shell was adopted in 1975, but the wonderful VDA engine sounded just the same. The Escort was an instant success with everyone that drove it. Unlike the Saab, it didn't need a specialist technique to make the most of it. 
rear-wheel drive. It just used to point into the corner. Had classic rear-wheel drive handling. You could then drive it around the corner on the throttle. The Escort must remain one of the most beautifully balanced rear-wheel drive cars ever to be rallied. We're filming this extravaganza at Weston Park, a stately home in Shropshire. In the 80s, it played a very significant role, particularly in 1987, when the entire Vauxhall team drowned out in this Ford that was very much deeper, and they virtually all retired. But the 80s will chiefly be remembered as the era of the Group B supercars. Limited production runs meant that manufacturers could spend massive amounts of money producing hugely powerful cars. It was Formula One for the forest. With over 400 horsepower in these lightweight Templar panel machines. This was a real era of points and spurs. Especially on the loose surfaces. But of course the drivers now had Gregoire de Medius's Subaru Impreza World Rally Car. But for driver satisfaction, these new World Rally Cars are superb. They're so well sorted, they get the same sort of joy to drive as those old Escorts did. A real sort of on the throttle driving, power in, oh, bit of opposite log. No longer brute. Just real satisfaction. Hey, Tony, I bet it wasn't like this in your day, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. The drivers used to take to it more care and consideration. Whoa! Oh, you spun it, you spun it. Now, now, can you imagine how much time you would have lost if you'd been on the Network Q rally? This car is just so well sorted. It is a dream to drive. Oh, I can't say that it's a pleasure to be a passenger in, but um, anyway, you're coming along quite well. We'll make room to rally driving yet. <laughs> 